What is going on, everybody? Welcome to another Road Reflections. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Kicking things off, starting up the old car. Gray, gloomy day here in Pittsburgh. I hope it's uh, it's not as bad of a day. Where where you are, I hope there is some sunshine for you to, to absorb. Uh... I hope that, that I hope you're having a less gloomy day than me. <laughs> that's uh, that's what I gotta say. Oh man, uh, it's the auxiliary cable there to the radio. It kind of tripped up a little bit. It's all it's 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 a gray and misty day too, where it's not really raining. Uh, it's sort of just like misting, which is super fucking annoying. Um, so, yeah, so I'm hoping wherever you are, it's a little warmer, it's a little less gray. I hope you're having a good day. Uh, let's do our check-in up at the top. A little check-in. Fucked up my neck today. I took a, a bunch of pain pills so that I could continue moving. I didn't do that first. I, I tend not to take the pain medication you know, I tried to stretch it out, I tried to massage it out, and, like, it just, it was, here's what happened. I bought, I got a pull-up bar, because I want to get back into, like, I'm just doing this so, like, I don't completely fucking fall apart in my 30s. Um, so, I'm trying to be more vigilant about, like, exercising, and some of you guys might know, I, I spe specifically, like, after... Well, really what gave me the opportunity to actually exercise and add exercising to my schedule was, um, you know, getting, getting, getting away from the ex-wife. <laughs> uh, when, when you don't have, um, another person's mental illness to be in charge of. Yeah. Uh, and... That kind of allowed me to like maintain a day like a daily schedule. When I was home, it allowed me to like have a decent schedule when I was on the road. Uh, so you know, when I was on the road, it was a little bit more difficult to do any sort of exercises. And I learned some body weight stuff that I that I liked, and I would try to do like ten or fifteen minutes of it. You know, because especially when you're stuck in a car, it's good to exercise. Especially when you have like a. Uh, what is it called? Sort of stationary job. It's good to like move around, get the blood pumping a little bit. Um, so I really started working out around then, and then over the summer I I hit it real hard, where you know it was like four or five days out of the week. Uh, I'm doing something. I'm being active. I'm going for these walks, and uh, and then over the summer. Uh, like, as, as it approached, this is, I mean, you, you know, new relationships and all are gonna take some more time, and they did, and I got a different job, um, the, the relationship really wasn't, like, affecting my workout schedule as much, uh, having, having another job kind of did a little bit, because it was, like, at the top of the week, and, you know, I would, um, do my best to take, you know, maintain some balance between work, uh, and personal life and the side gig, and so then I just kind of fell out of it for, for like a majority of September, um, I did, I did some here and there, but like August and September I really fell out of it, uh, did some, would go for a walk here and there, uh, and then October was where it really fell apart. Uh, that's whenever the big major stress stuff began. That's, I think, whenever, like, you know, the depression was setting in and everything. And, uh, so I haven't, I've been trying to get back into it slowly. And over the last maybe four weeks, I've been getting back into it. And, you know, last week was, uh, there was a lot more chaos than anticipated and, so I was like, this week I'll hit it. I'll I'll go. I'll get back into it. I'll I'll start working out again. And I bought this pull up bar and I started doing pull ups because I I, I realized that uh, my pull up strength is not is not where it used to be. Uh, remotely close. I used to be able to do like twelve or thirteen of them. Very, you know, without 
without being uh, exhausted or anything. And um, you know, so I was like, I gotta rebuild this strength. And uh, so I tried doing that, and I yanked my neck. I think I, I popped it in the wrong way. What I think really affected it first, more than anything, was the traps. I fucked up my traps, and then uh, and then it just went into my neck. And then, like for a, for a short period of time, like I li I couldn't move my left side at all. <laughs> uh, so I put I put like this heating pad on it for for a while, um, and then I was like I it, I'm I'm it's up and down. I can get most of my mobility back but not all of it, and I have to be real careful about how I go about it, so, uh, yeah, that's the thing that happened today, so, you know, then I took some pain medication, because I was like, well, I gotta get through the rest of the day, and I gotta be able to move around a little bit, so, took some, took some pain meds, and, um, that helped, a warm shower, uh, by warm, I mean incredibly hot shower, uh, that helps, and, you know, before I go to bed, I'll, I'll put some magnesium cream on it, and uh, hopefully by tomorrow it'll be okay, and I can do I can do a lighter workout, so I'm not like totally bummed out. But if this thing is still in pain or something like that, what I might end up doing is continue to do more stretches, um, just keep my body active in, in some way, shape, or form. Because the unfortunate thing with weather like this is you can't really go on the walks that I uh, would have loved to go on. So. Um, other than that, you know, still, I'm, I'm okay. The depression comes on and off. The anxiety comes on and off. Um, taking care of that through some, uh, through some therapy, through some, 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 uh, herbal medications, um, things of that sort. So, uh, yeah. Hopefully you guys are doing well out there. Hopefully your Thanksgiving was good. Hopefully your weekend was good. Uh, hope you guys got a four-day weekend out of the, out of the, the this this situation that we're in. Uh, some people did, some people did, you know. Uh, so, um, but I got I got uh, I got some topics for the road reflection. So I think we should jump into the into the old RR, the old road reflectioni. Uh, Got a little bit of breaking news for you guys. Uh, breaking in the terms that uh, corporate mainstream media hasn't really fucking talked about this issue mm, at all. This happened last week in Louisville, Kentucky, home of the Uncle Tom DA that uh, basically did not get justice for Breonna Taylor, uh, continued to defend killer cops, uh, and on that matter, there were a lot of protests and activists that were out uh, asking for justice, asking for a complete, complete change of the criminal justice system, um, to funding the police, looking at community organizations, looking at ways to, uh, you know, uh, get more funding to social services, to, uh, psychological services, mental health services, things of that sort, and getting rid of hyper-violent individualistic practices that we call American law enforcement. Um... And last Monday, seven days ago, one of the one of the lead activists, his name was Hamza Travis Nagdi. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. I apologize if I'm not. He went by Travis, right? Or or that was his nickname, among many nicknames that he had was uh, gunned down in, a, in an attempted, or, or rather what, what People.com reports as a botched uh, carjacking. So, so what does that mean, botched carjacking? They, they didn't get away with the car, they killed the dude. That's, or, or you could just call it a murder. Like, couldn't you have called it a murder instead of a botched carjacking? <laughs> That's how people decided to, to write about it. A botched carjacking. Oh, not a successful murder? A 
of a black activist calling for justice against uh, the wrongful termination of a black citizen in America by killer cops who were too trigger happy and unloaded a barrage of bullets into this girl, lady's house. That was a botched act of law enforcement. That was botched protect and serve. How's that? So, he got killed, and there's a couple of media outlets covering it. A couple of media outlets. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, I got this from a friend of mine. I, I didn't even see it. It didn't, it didn't come up in, in my circles either. Uh, this has been kept relatively quiet. And, and we'll see, you know, and here's the thing. Uh, I wonder how quickly suppressed this video is going to get or talking about it. So, you know, I don't know. I, I, if you end up seeing this video, you know, share it on social media, send it via email, um, send it to people through Messenger and DMs, whatever you have to do, because even social media might suppress a story like this. And I'll talk about the implications of that in just a minute. USA Today did a thing. There's a couple local uh, alternative rags that did it, but nothing from the big three, right? CNN, MSNBC, uh, I think MSN covered it. But they all kind of say the same thing. Oh, there was a carjacking, and he unfortunately died. And, uh, well, the authorities are looking, but they don't have any leads. They don't have any leads to figure out who killed this activist. Um, and for a week, this story kind of just sat there, and it stayed cold. And, and now it's now you know, the, with the pace of how quickly things move within the media, uh, you know what happens to this guy? What happens to getting justice for him? Regardless of whether it was racially motivated, whether it was politically motivated or not, you should be aiming to get justice for someone that was murdered in cold blood. And the media is is silencing the story. They covered it a little bit, and that's probably just enough for them to say that, you know, hey, liability, no problem. You can't sue us for anything. Why? Why? Why are you, not, I mean, fucking media loves murder. That's, it, you know, it gets the pundits talking. It gets people to come out of the woodwork, right? Like, you get to have on experts, you, you know, and they weigh in and they talk about this, that, and the third. How, uh, you know, why we need more protection and more law enforcement, get the cameras up on the streets and facial recognition and all this other bullshit that comes along with covering a fucking murder case. The media loves murder cases. Yet, when it's the murder of a 21-year-old black activist that's out there looking for justice for Breonna Taylor, who was illegally murdered by three gun-toting, fucking chest-thumping, law and order motherfuckers in the Louisville Police Department, yeah, let's let's make let's sh 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 shush that story up. Very strange. And and there's gonna be you know there, there's gonna be so many fucking excuses that come out of this because anytime something like this, then you criticize corporate media and you criticize you know uh, how leader. I mean, none of the Democrats have talked about it, right? They put their Black Lives Matter stickers and they got their pins and they dress in the African robes and all that stuff. And when it comes down to a black activist that was shot and murdered, 
they're fine with media calling it a botched carjacking because the car wasn't stolen. Hey, at least that, well, what a positive spin on that story, huh? The car got to, the car's fine. You got, the car is fine. What are we even worried about? Hamza Travis Nagby was murdered. We are going to throw a litany of excuses as to why the media did not fucking cover any of this beyond Monday. Why isn't anyone pressured to Louisville DA for a comment? You're going to hear a litany of excuses like, oh, do you know how many carjackings there are in America? You know, and a lot of them, uh, we can't solve, they can't solve, the cops can't solve it. There's so many carjackings. Well, it kind of sounds like we have a good reason to defund the police for incompetency. I mean, we're giving some police departments billions of dollars. Most police departments get hundreds of millions of dollars. And you're telling me that they can't figure out who carjacked Hamza Tra Travis Nagby? Well, there's a rise in homicides in Louisville. This is like the 145th one or something. You know, the the, the, the police have a lot of pressing matters going on. These these Well, this is a homicide. Corporate media can call it whatever it wants to fucking call it, but it's a homicide. By framing it as a botched carjacking, it makes it sound less than what it actually is. So then, you know, because what this sounds like now is, well then, we need to defund the police because they clearly are not doing their job. Maybe we need to build a better task force for homicides instead of just the police department that, you know, go guns a blazing into, you know, issuing no-knock warrants, killing innocent civilians, and then getting away with it. And then having a fucking DA that says what happened was fair. So then it goes to the media, right? That's the, the they'll make excuses, people will make excuses for the media. And oh, well, you know, there's so much to cover, Chris, you know, sometimes slower stories just slip through the cracks. They slip through the... We just had a presidential election. Yeah, we did. And we know that Joe Biden is no friend of the black community. We know that Joe Biden is putting war hawks, corporatists, and neoliberals who are pro-bank, pro-war, and pro-fucking over the black community into his cabinet. But hey, a couple of them are black and brown people, so we should... You know, thumbs up. They wore a Black Lives Matter pin when they were talking about, you know, when they were delivering their platitudes. Come on. There has to be a spin, right? How else is corporate media going to show that black lives absolutely do matter by nonstop coverage of an old white dementia patient that is now in charge of this country. Do you have a 24 hour news cycle? You don't think you can take a break for an hour from this this non-stop fucking Joe Biden hand job that let's be honest, he might be confused he's getting. And you can't talk about the murder of a protester in Louisville. Protesting police murder of an innocent woman. Twenty-four hour news up, you can't even spend maybe fifteen minutes. There are no excuses for this. There is no excuse for why a story like this goes cold. Why there isn't more being done. Oh, we're stretched thin. Are you? Well, 
then maybe your budget should reflect how thin you're stretched. Does your budget doesn't show that you're stretched thin? Your budget shows that you shouldn't be stretched thin. Enormous police budgets. Enormous. The big question I think a lot of people, uh, well not a lot of people, some people might have is, is this a state sponsored murder? Right? You have a lead activist of one of the largest civil rights move movements we've seen uh, this side of the century and, uh, and then he just gets killed and the story gets buried, the cops aren't talking, the DA hasn't made a, a, a statement, Democrats haven't made a statement. I mean, this is a big movement. Everything that's happening in Louisville, from, from, from the shooting itself, to the protests in the streets, to the cops violently attacking said protesters in the streets, to the grand jury giving one cop a sentence for firing at an inanimate object. That's right, he, went, he's gonna, he might go to jail for firing at the wrong inanimate object, not murdering a black woman. You don't think that an activist dying in that community, a protester dying in that community, a, a lead protester, and one that was doing as much organizing as Hamdi Travis Nagdi, that that story deserves national attention? Very, very bizarre. And we know that this sort of stuff happens. MLK, Malcolm X, what the... Uh, the FBI did with the Black Panthers with, the, you know because that's what's next the, the, the next step is well if if, uh, if the police aren't going to be protecting our communities if we have no reason to feel safe in the presence of police then the citizens need to, to, to push back on that and take control and that's what the Panthers did right they had a constitutional right to bear arms they stood far away from uh, the police brandishing their guns, which is their constitutional right to do. They were well within the right to observe the police to make sure that they weren't doing anything wrong. And take what we learn. The, what we learn from from the Panthers is that some of them got a little too cocky. Uh, you, you you did have some members like Eldridge Cleaver who were um, looking for a war with the cops rather than, um, you know, some, some sense of peace and order. And to create a better society. So is that that far-fetched of an idea? No. Do I have any evidence of it? I don't. I could, I merely merely making a suggestion that hey this is this should not be a rock we leave unturned someone standing up for first amendment rights was gunned down and uh, we have very little that's being done about it so far and the media is forcing this story to go as cold as it possibly can Let's move to story number two. Uh, Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority (PWSA) uh, was caught was caught uh, dumping sludge into the Allegheny River. They pleaded guilty to it after they were caught. Uh, and, uh, they, they were in violation of the Clean Water Act, the CWA, the Clean Water Act, which basically says that you cannot dump toxic waste, sludge, uh, chemicals, chemical runoffs, things of that sort, uh, into any sort of water supply, to any sort of major water supply, right? And circle, you know, this is, this is basic ecosystem science stuff. 
these contaminants will, will ride up in the food chain. And guess what? We're part of that fucking food chain. They pled guilty for doing this. Now, uh, the PWSA is, uh, is a private corporation that is in charge of the water and sewer utilities in the city of Pittsburgh, where I live. Uh, the PWSA has also dug up a giant portion of the sidewalk in front of my house uh, and has done dick all with it except put a bunch of caution tape around it. <laughs> so, like, in right in front of the front patio, it's just this giant fucking gravelly hole with a metal pipe sticking out of it, or two metal pipes sticking uh, and they said that they were going to work on it the last week, did that, and then never came back. Because it, I maybe think I got too close to the, I don't know, I don't really fucking know. But uh, the day before Thanksgiving, they said they were going to come back for, for the day, and nothing said. Um, here's the crazy part about this violation, right, the Clean Water Act. They violated this for seven years. For the last seven years, the PWSA has been dumping sludge into the Allegheny River, lying to the EPA about it, and now they got caught. For seven years, they were basically endangering the water supply in Pittsburgh. Seven years. Even if the water supply wasn't being endangered, people fish out of that river, people travel in that river, people swim in that river. There's boaters that happen to be in that river. You don't think toxic sludge is going to affect them negatively at all. You're out of your damn mind. Just out of your damn mind. Seven years, so they fucking. How do you even justify doing that? And that's probably why they pled guilty, right? Like, there is no justification. It was basically them getting caught and saying, uh, whoopsie. Every. Okay, you got us. And here's the thing, right? You, you, just, just a minute ago, I mentioned that they were a private corporation that is in charge of uh, water and sewer in the city of Pittsburgh, which means that they turn a profit, and they do. Make two hundred and fifty million dollars a year, just about, uh, in profits, some net profits, and they got fined five hundred thousand dollars. They make two hundred and fifty million dollars, and they got fined five hundred thousand dollars for breaking the law for seven straight years, and then fucking lying about it. $500,000 is nothing to a company that makes $250 million a year. I did the math. That's 0.2% of what they make on a yearly basis. So this is a slap on the wrist at best because for seven, for, and this is for a crime they were committing for seven straight years. For seven straight years. And they lied about it. They broke the law for seven... You know if someone breaks the law for seven years? If if, if one American is caught, uh, let's say, not paying taxes for seven years, that's millions of dollars in fines. I mean, they're, they're done for for the rest of their life. They might go to prison because they can't financially pay the, 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 the taxes back. They financially ruined this person. Corporation breaks the law and they get a slap on the wrist at 0.2% of their annual income. And then the law, here, here's the other part of the law, which, you know, is like, it's such a sad sh fucking fact that we have to put this into, into effect. Is, uh, there, the part, of the, part of the law goes, uh, it says, uh, uh, you can't it, raise the uh, amount people have to pay to PWSA to cover the cost of the fine. Right? A corporation that makes more money than most of the people that use their services are like, oh man, $500,000, 0.2%, it's a 
deficit. Oh, I better make up that money somehow because my unfettered greed needs to be constantly fed. So we have to put a law in place that says, hey, no. Your greed's gonna have to be satiated. But at least it's not, you know, a million dollars. Couldn't you, it's not even one million, it's not even breaking a mill. Like, this is such a joke. The CEO of, of, of PWSA should be in the fucking river clearing the sludge out with a spoon. I mean, there should be other cleaning, you know, effects in place, too, because I'd rather have a clean river, but he should be fucking in there, getting it out with a spoon. He should spend seven years cleaning rivers across the country. They should be fired from being in charge of water and sewer in Pittsburgh. Germain is a public utility, should not be under private control. If it's under private control, they, they get to make these business deals instead of, you know, this is a health and safety concern. They'll do what they did in Flint, right? They'll, they get to partner with the bottled water companies and be like, well, maybe you should sponsor something in Pittsburgh now. That that might happen. They might come out and, you know, you, you have Nestle at the doors going, guys, come grab your Nestle. In fact, if you live, we're, we're going to drop ne uh, bottled water prices by, uh, by 50 cents. We're going to drop our bottled water prices to help Pittsburgh. Drinking bottled water has, uh, look, and, and I'm guilty of it too. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm I'm I'm, a, I'm I, I can be hypocritical. I don't like to, to drink the bottled water, but you know, living at home with a bunch of different people, so Brita, we don't have enough. We don't we don't have a big enough Brita container. I've done that before, and it's difficult. <laughs> uh, hey, unless you wanted. Give us one of those water purifiers that are also very expensive, uh, you know, to, to hook on to our um, faucets there. But, you know, where's the city of Pittsburgh doing that? Where's PWSA? Dude, that should be part of their fucking fine. They should be, they should be paying for people to have one of those things installed in all their faucets. Excuse me. The cost of bad water is catastrophic, catastrophic, right? Because then you do have to replace it with either a filter that a lot of people can't afford because they're too expensive and people are living paycheck to paycheck, or you have to go the bottled water route. Or you have to go the bottled water route. And if you go, go the bottled water route, um, you know, you, you, you end up with even more environmental problems. Because then you have to worry about how the bottle of water is being made, right? And plastic uses up a lot of oil, so we're not getting rid of fossil fuels. We're actually making the fossil fuel issue worse. Uh, that bo a bottle of water is going to get dumped. It's not going to get recycled. It's going to wind up in some fucking landfill or some fucking recycling center. It's not going to go away anywhere. Sorry, I just got these hiccups. And they're not. They're not going away. Bottled water is not cheaper. You know, so it's, it can. It, there is a level of convenience to it, I suppose. But 
but this issue is, I mean, it's just so dumb to, to do something like this. They should be, I mean, that's, if you really want this to stick, that corporation, PWSA, should, should be purchasing. They should put their own money into it. One of those attachments for your sink, for, for your for your faucets that, that purifies the water. PWSA should purchase that as punishment for seven years of dumping sludge in the Allegheny River. This comical. Depressingly comical. Sorry about the hiccups. The last thing I do want to talk about is something I, I, I feel like goes without saying, but I feel like I do have to say it, uh, is that this, this pandemic that we're all living through, and if we live through it, we're lucky to live through it, but this pandemic that we are, um, are living through now is I mean this this the issue of it is intersectional it involves a lot of different issues every every aspect of our lives is affected by it and I don't think people really fully understand that people act like it's it doesn't affect every aspect of our lives and part of that is because of it, it, oh, how serious the government has actually taken this thing, right? The government hasn't taken it as seriously as it could have. Uh, if it did, it would it would do what every other industrialized nation did, um, which is moratoriums on debts and rents, eviction, uh, you, you stopped all, all all evictions, universal basic income, and health care for all. Now, in terms of the UBI, some you know that's an economic thing, right? That's that's one thing that I've that I've been saying through and through is that you can't you can't have lockdown measures like the one that you have without any sort of economic incentive behind it. You just can't. Um, in the very beginning of this, Tulsi Gabbard was Tulsi Gabbard was the only person that was talking about this. But she basically said, like, look, we need to put the universal basic income into place right now because if we don't, uh, then people are just going to keep going to work whether they have this disease or not because they need to earn a paid check because paid leave doesn't exist in 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 American capitalism in the American work culture. And, you know, we, we, we need some sort of economic incentive for people to stay home when they're sick. And applying a universal basic income of even just $1,000 a month will, will incentivize people to stay home if they're sick all the time. Didn't do it. And that's part of what was happening, by the way. Part of what was happening was that people were sick or getting sick or asymptomatic carriers and they were still going to work. I mean, I, I was caught up in it too. I, I really didn't know whether I should cancel my shows in the very, very beginning of this in March. You know, I had, I had my album recording dates coming up and I was like, do I go through with it? Do I not go through with it? What do I do here? How do I supplement my income if, if this touring thing is gone? And I, I'm you know, I fell into the same mindset that I think a lot of people did. But just a thousand dollars a month would have, you know, insanely changed my, my predicament. I would have been like, let's reschedule. Let's not worry about it. And I did. 
I ended up having to cancel the reschedule dates as well. And, uh, and eventually people stopped going to work because there was an order to lock everything down. Right? Essential workers only. So, there's the economy of the job market. Now, then the elective procedures, and we're back in that boat, where some of the elective procedures are also uh, MIA. They're, you know, and that's the healthcare industry. And let's talk about the healthcare industry. You have nurses that are being forced to work in, in states like North Dakota, and, and in Pennsylvania, you're seeing nurses strikes. Um, you're seeing in uh, healthcare industry that's run by profit, that's run by um, capitalism, that is failing because it can't keep up with this virus. Because it didn't. Because America didn't do what other countries did. They didn't create a space for coronavirus. And then again, you knew wave two was fucking coming. Wave two, unlike my hiccups, uh, were uh, you could see were coming. Too bad that I'm hiccuping. But the healthcare industry is over encumbered. They can't handle any more patients. <coughs> they can't handle any more people in the ICUs. And it sucks. But if you gave people Medicare for all, if you came up with a plan and said, give us two to four weeks, let's figure out where we're gonna put some, some of these patients that are gonna come in. And some of the patients that came in are partly because people went to work and spread the disease there because they couldn't fucking afford to <laughs> not go to work. Some of the people needed to go to fucking Mardi Gras, which is a thing that happened. Literally, I mean, that was the thing. People couldn't afford to go to work. People needed to party. Spread this thing around when there should have been uh, a, an immediate lockdown. Over-encumbered hospitals because of capitalism and profit. I mean, people were championing fucking Andrew Cuomo because he can finish a sentence that Biden fucking apparently can't. And that dude cut like 900,000 hospital beds. That was that was right be right before the pandemic, by the way. Like the me of schools. They cut the schools, right? The schools went into hybrid models or what have you. Oh, wow, they are not letting me through. There's something going on with traffic up here, and it's there was a nice thing with the environment, though, for a little while. You know, the, they were uh, there were some nice animals that got to come back out and do their thing do their thing and stuff so that was kind of cool that was kind of nice and but education they cut the schools the, the, the education aspect of it is I mean we I've talked about it pretty endlessly is they should have come up with a plan for virtual teaching they should have they should have immediately come up with a plan for, for virtual no questions asked you, you know, like there should have been something for virtual teaching and there just wasn't. 
com I mean, it was it was uh, like the edu the education system was completely botched, completely botched. They screwed people over left and right. Teachers had to learn new systems. They forgot those systems. So then now that goes back to the work end of things, right? So some schools did stay at the, they, they decided they're going to do virtual teaching. Well, what happens to those kids? So were, are the parents going to be okay staying at home and, uh, and watching their kids and trying to do their jobs? How are families supposed to split up like this? Again, it goes back to if you give families universal basic income, then one parent can say, okay, I will go in Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and if you want to go in Tuesday, Thursday, and maybe supplement some time on the weekend, we should be able to make this thing work, and everything will be fine. But what opportunity were American families given to, to make that call? Not. They were given no opportunities to make that call. <laughs> And now teachers are suffering. And now they might bring it home to their families. Because the kids are getting it in school. Every little thing is connected. And all, and all of it centralizes down to if you give people a financial incentive just to stay home till we can beat this thing. So we decrease the spread of it. So we decrease... A public health problem. Isn't capitalism supposed to be the system that is so rich and so wealthy that everybody's taken care of so well? Here we are. You know, it's a fail. It's a failed system. It's a failed state. Is that that's that's how you can you know, and, and it's all because COVID has shown us the flaws in our in, in, in the system but the system is too proud of itself so it has no reason to sit there and look at the flaws and accept the flaws and change the flaws that's the, the reality and that's what COVID has shown us about the system so if you if you don't get it yet look at how every little thing affects every other thing Education affects the hospitals. You know, it, it, it affects the workforce. It affects the economy. And it didn't need to be like this. All right, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up here. I gotta figure out what's going on with this crazy ass traffic. Uh, but thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, I am going to probably in the next week or two make an announcement about Forkful Virtual, uh, virtual live virtual Forkful of Noodles shows probably once, maybe twice a month. Um, and uh, you know, I've got some good episodes. I've got some interesting episodes of Taboo Table Talk coming up as well. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled for that. And. Uh, I'll be doing these pretty regularly. I'll also be um, uh, doing live streams every Friday. Uh, th those are going to be coming out on every Friday. So make sure you're subscribed to me either on YouTube, Facebook, or Rockfin. Go to Rockfin. Go to rockfin.com slash krishmohanhaha. Become a subscriber there. Uh, if you do become a subscriber, it's ten, 10 bucks a month. You get all of my premium content, but you also get premium content from... Uh, Various other content creators, Ron Placone, Lee Camp, Jimmy Dore, uh, Graham Elwood, Slow News Day, Action for Assange, Hardlands Media, uh, ton, tons, tons of people are moving over to Rock, Rockfin right now, um, and they are a ad-free blockchain crypto site that is primarily focused on helping uh, content creators earn money and not be suppressed. So that's part of the reason why I, I like them. I really, I'm really i super sorry about the hiccups in the last segment. And throughout the closing here, I feel really bad about it. But, uh, yeah, I guess sometimes it happens. Anyway, uh, 
I'm going to close things up here. Go to my website, become a sustaining member. If you have the ability to, download one of my albums, listen to one of my albums, check out past episodes of my show. <laughs> KrishmohanHaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. All right, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thanks.